Egyptian scribes wrote hieroglyphs for 3,500 years, from the dawn of history until they fell silent, decades before the fall of Rome. They took one final gasp in this temple, home of the last known inscription. And yet today I get to animate not a story of loss, but of success, a tale of what ancient Egyptians sounded like, and more importantly, how we know. There's a popular narrative about the rediscovery of ancient Egyptian. It involves a Frenchman, an Englishman, and a stone. The first time I heard it, I remember cozying up on the couch to some documentary. You know, one where the camera pans slowly through pillars across temple walls, then cuts to a bright sun flare and clashing synth cymbals. It went like this. In ancient times, the hieroglyphs were forgotten dusty relics until the 1800s when Napoleon invaded Egypt. A stone was found, the Rosetta Stone. Scholars marveled over the puzzling strings of birds and snakes and hooks and limbs. The stone bore two Egyptian scripts and auspiciously a rough translation in perfectly readable Greek. Champollion and Young both raced to unlock its secrets tediously matching names in the Greek text back to the mysterious Egyptian symbols. By most accounts, the Frenchman won the game, and the language of Egypt was at long last restored. Oh, past self, I know you were cozy and awestruck. Sorry to disenchant you. That story is... You think I'm about to say wrong? No, not that. More missing something, hiding in plain sight in history, and even those famed decipherer's own words. Something we can uncover by asking a different question. Not who deciphered it, but what did it sound like and how do we know? 1810. Years before his celebrated decipherment of Egyptian hieroglyphs, here is Champollion hurrying through the streets of Paris. He's begun to make regular visits to learn from Abuna Yohanna, Father John from Egypt, whose liturgical and cultural language is Coptic. The Abuna receives meager payments for his work here, yet in a move familiar to Egyptians after him who have experienced their share of the long history of human migration, Abuna has been sending much of what he earns back to support the families of his two deceased brothers. Champollion, as we see in his writings, is absolutely convinced that Coptic is the Egyptian language, the very same one that stretches back continuously for thousands of years and that until he can dream in Coptic, he will never understand ancient Egypt. Coptic, to outside eyes, looks like Greek with a bit of a Nile flourish. Indeed, it's written in an adapted form of the old Greek uppercase alphabet, with both consonants and vowels, and that's about to become very significant. But in addition to the starter kit of 25 Greek letters, Copts use seven letters derived not from Greek, but from late forms of Egyptian signs, the first hint at decipherment. Champollion eagerly absorbs all of the grammar and sounds as Abuna teaches, and within years of work, it'll be by plugging in Coptic sounds and working from Coptic grammar that the decipherer will finally be able to peer back into the hieroglyphs. Major hitches impeded truly revealing their sounds. First, the consonants. Sure, many have parallels in Coptic, but what did they really sound like back then? The consonants were merely pesky nuisances compared to the dust cloud that looms over Egyptologists to this day. Hieroglyphs are a desert of consonants. Where were the missing vowels? Egyptologists scratched their heads and scribbled in some placeholders as a convenient way to pronounce words. Not because they thought Egyptians really sounded like this, they just found it easier to read Hatshepsut than Hatshepsut. Arbitrary proxies aside, which sounds really echoed in these ancient gaps between the consonants? Well, since Coptic is Egyptian, and Egyptian documents are plentiful and span such a long time, Egyptologists could compare Egyptian to itself. This is internal reconstruction, and it resulted in an explosion of hieroglyphic knowledge. 
it reopened a full human language, one that built words using a template where roots are these abstract things made up of consonants. Egyptians would then fill in that template with vowels to make a word. Well, since they didn't write those vowels, how do we refill their vowels when we're stumped by a beautiful example like nfrit? Well, compare Coptic dialects and guess it might have sounded like nafrat or nofrat. What about an animal's horn? It's db. Well, that's a tep. And name, run? Why, it's a rin. And kmet, meaning Egypt? Well, fill it in, kemet. How about permit, meaning the person? Paromat. Though you three stay put, because as we'll learn, your stories have a twist. Evidence also comes from the languages Egyptian interacted with, both in words they borrowed and words they lent. In the New Kingdom, during the reign of Ramses II, a decades-long conflict dragged on between Egypt and the Hittites. Wearily, the two sides settled on a peace treaty. They wrote this treaty in two versions, in hieroglyphs on a temple wall at Karnak, and on tablets in cuneiform. The elaborate hieroglyphic title of Ramses starts with two words, Nesut, king of Upper Egypt, and Biti, king of Lower Egypt. Well, in cuneiform, these get written out entirely in syllables. After comparison, you might reconstruct an old pronunciation, like Nesi Biat. Do you notice something? Ramses' Egyptian seems to be dropping consonants and presumably some vowels. It's evidence that the language changed over time. Indeed, it evolved in stages from old to middle to late to Demotic and Coptic. So Egyptian changed. Changed from what? Answers came from linguistic clues far beyond Egypt. Over 2,000 kilometers southeast of Cairo, in this pocket of Ethiopia, there's a cluster of languages grouped together under the label Omotic. The people here are of course perfectly comfortable with their languages, while linguists are left less comfortable. To many, Omotic shares traits with a broad family throughout North Africa and West Asia called Afroasiatic. But Omotic is hard to classify to such an extent that others don't see family traits reflected at all. So why this detour? Simply because the traits used to make the call on Omotic are found in other languages. These traits echo in the streets of Cairo today, where you won't hear the latest form of Coptic, but Masri or Egyptian Arabic. Arabic is in the Semitic branch of Afroasiatic, and by the way, it was in Arabic that medieval scholars made the first attempts at relating hieroglyphs to Coptic sounds. Who else should have these family resemblances but Egyptian? Afroasiatic linguists placed Egypt in its own branch. They compared these various branches and traced them back to a common ancestor, Proto-Afroasiatic, leaving us with a picture of the position of Egyptian within a family. Now you could look for sounds by rewinding up from Coptic to Ancient Egyptian. You could also start to fast forward down from prehistory and triangulate sounds from a more remote past, ancient even to them. Sure, Coptic easily fills in the E in Rin and the A in Tep. On the other hand, there are words where Coptic doesn't match the vowels in its Afroasiatic relatives. In fact, it looks like many O's must have been earlier A's. Anuk, the pronoun I, came from an older Yanak. And do you remember the way I said the word for person with an O, Roma? Well, that shifted from earlier Ramat. And when I guessed that beautiful might be Nafrat or Nofrat, well, now we know why. It changed in stages from Nafrat to Nofra. Scrutinizing sound changes gets tricky. Take the word Wunawit. The hypothesis is that it sounded something like Wunawat. And now you know the word for those unequal Egyptian hours from my clocks video. Incompletely, because its first vowel remains unclear to us today. The uncertainties don't stop there. Why is there no early hieroglyph for the consonant L? And which signs were pronounced L in which periods? And is D a voiced, emphatic, or unaspirated T? 
And what in the duat is the value of this sign? Alas, this is not a phonology class. We're starting to miss the delta for the reeds. The key point is this. What I didn't realize, all cozy in front of that documentary, is that it took all this, understanding Egyptians' ancestors, its relatives, and its descendants, to figure out that Aten's name was Yatin, that Ankh, meaning live, was pronounced Anach, and then later Olnach, and that Egypt's name, Kema, was earlier Kumat, and its language, Ra'nikumat. Thank you for taking this Egyptological journey with me to rediscover the sound of the longest written language on Earth. Thanks to patrons for following my updates, supporting me, and appreciating the artwork along the way. To everyone watching, stick around and subscribe for language. <laughs>